Welcome to the Ernie Chambers Show. Friends, enemies, neutrals, brothers and sisters. People wonder why I offer that kind of an introduction. Well, I want to include everybody. I have a friend or two. I know I have enemies, but if you're watching, all of you are welcome. This is one of those situations where I'm going to talk about something that people are misinformed about, and the ones with the least information are doing the most talking. You hear the letters CRT, which stand for critical race theory. The word critical is important. Critical could mean something very serious or something analytical, something which has been studied, something that is essential and necessary. Critical race theory is something that the white Republicans are using to make an outright overt direct appeal to the racism that they know is in them and they know it is in white people in general. The thing that proves that white people are generally racist is the fact that their politicians make a direct appeal to that at least two guys running for governor talk about being against critical race theory, and I bet neither one of them could tell what this is about. And before I get through, I will put it in a nutshell, but I can do that now. Black people know this, scholars know it, people who've done ordinary superficial reading of American history know it. America is a country that was founded on slavery. Its economy was built on slavery. It was the only system in the world where capital, which is the money and the profit producing items was connected to labor. The black people who were enslaved served the function of being both capital because they had a monetary value and labor because they did the work. This happened nowhere else, anywhere in the country, anywhere else, I mean, in the world. And there was no slavery as inhumane, brutal, cruel, and murderous, full of sexual violence and assault by slave owners, slaveholders on black women and men and children. That is why there were white people in the North who would pay to spend time on a plantation for a few nights so they could beat the slaves, they could have sexual favors with men, women, or children. And if you read history, you'd know this because there were written accounts of it by white people. But Americans do not read history, not knowing their history, politicians not knowing history, all kind of craziness and absurdities are presented as the truth. There were travelers to this country from Europe who wrote about the conditions they saw on these slave plantations. And by the way, every colony with the exception of Massachusetts allowed slave holding and in fact did hold slaves. If everything about slavery is to be banned from the teaching that it goes on in the schools, nothing can be taught about the US Constitution. I'm working on an article that I will submit to the World Herald at some point. So I'm not going to give away this information that anybody would have who reads the Constitution. But people who talk about it don't read it. And I know this. So when statements are made by these politicians about being against critical race theory and the flat assertion that white parents don't want this taught in the schools, it shows how racist, but mainly how absolutely ignorant 
they are. I'm going to do a little bit of reading today to give a bit of background and understanding. And I will read so it won't be taken as just my opinion. You can take it as my personal comments and convince yourself that I'm not really reading, but those people are not the ones I'm trying to reach. I'm trying to reach those who may have at least two or three brain cells operational. In no society throughout history was the populace at large highly educated. There was a period in Europe known as the Renaissance. That's when the arts, literature, drama were supposed to really flourished, but the ordinary people were not a part of that. Even the run of the mill writer or scribbler was a part of it. There are a few names associated with the Renaissance, whether it's painting, drama, music, whatever. So a period in history may carry a name or a title, but it does not designate what is going on for the ordinary people. There is a term Luddite, which has to do with people who stand against anything that's new and will destroy whatever is new. They don't realize that there was a guy whose name was Ludd, L-U-D-D. -D. He was worried, and those who followed him, that with the growing technology in those days, machinery, there would be jobs taken and the laboring people would be out in the cold without any way to make a living. So they systematically went to factories and wherever machinery could be found and did what they could do to destroy it. And the people who followed Lud were known as Luddites. And that term Luddite has come to mean anybody who stands against progress and will do whatever is within his or her power to stop the flow of progress. So what we are dealing with are Luddites, and they don't even know what the term means. I'm going to read from an article that appeared in the New Republic. It's a magazine, July and August of last year. The headline would be, how a filmmaker created the frenzy over, quote, critical race theory. Before this guy, it was not anything out in the public domain as it is now. Last September, that would be last year, an obscure 36-year-old documentarian named Christopher Rufo landed a slot on Tucker Carlson tonight which is on Fox television. Knowing the president would be watching, he sounded the alarm about an ideology almost obscure as he was, critical race theory. Rufo, who describes the theory as the notion that the United States was, quote, founded on white supremacy and oppression, unquote, begged Donald Trump to take action. Critical race theory, he warned, had become the, quote, default ideology of the federal bureaucracy, unquote. The next morning, Rufo got a call from Mark Meadows, the president's chief of staff, just a few days. Oh, then just a few days later, the White House issued a bizarre memo instructing public agencies to root out the theory from government trainings. Nobody even knew what it was. So what people did know about was what was referred to as sensitivity training, where supervisors and others were taught to be knowledgeable and aware of differences among the employees who worked there. Avoid insulting words, conduct, and other things that were demeaning and hurtful. That was the only thing these white people knew. So Trump issued an order that there could be no more sensitivity training in any government operation or in any company 
run by a contractor who had business with the federal government. So they equated sensitivity training where you teach people to treat each other with respect was equated with this vague notion that had been put out there of critical race theory and the one using it didn't know what it meant. In the months since Rufo's TV appearance, roughly a dozen states from Idaho to Tennessee have passed or considered legislation banning critical race theory from schools and government institutions. You'll notice when it's mentioned by politicians, they don't even describe it, let alone explain it. That is the secret code for the racists, the white supremacists, the Ku Klux Klaners, and all those who've always hated black people, they're opposed to the LGBTQ community and so forth. Almost overnight, Rufo, and some may have never heard of him, his name is spelled R-U-F-O. Rufo has become the standard bearer for a hysterical movement to solve a problem that may not even exist. And in the process, charted a course for the right wingers in the, bear, uh, in the Biden era. With a likable moderate in the White House, the task for operatives like Rufo is to gin up evidence of an overwhelming conspiracy everywhere, convincing voters that the left has taken over the school and the workplace, which the schools didn't even know, nor people in the workplace, nor anybody else. Rufo has had an unusual career. He came up not through the traditional conservative biosphere, but as a man about town documentarian. He made a film about roughing it in Mongolia that the New York Times called, quote, self-involved, and a PBS documentary about inner city poverty. Last year, after the Floyd protests, remember the cop held his knee on Floyd's neck for nine and a half minutes. He learned that the city of Seattle was hosting a racial sensitivity training where white employees were urged to practice, quote, self-talk that affirms their complicity in racism, unquote. Now, I've never heard of a formal presentation of that kind, but what this Rufo needed to do was to scour the country, and if he could find somebody who would use something like that, which is inflammatory to these white people who are ignorant, that's what he would use and say, this is what's going on all over the country. So that was one of the items he put in his grab bag. Supported by Patreon, and more recently by a Manhattan Institute fellowship, Rufo started collecting tips from other, quote, whistleblowers, unquote, about funky language in diversity trainings from Cupertino, California, where third graders were asked to rank themselves according to privilege. How would they even know what privilege means? Whether that happened or not, I don't know. To New York City, where a principal urged parents to be, quote, white traitors, unquote, and advocate for, quote, white abolition, unquote, none of these things have I heard about. Rufo did not answer questions about whether he has other affiliations or funding sources. The past year has produced a remarkable amount of hand wringing and self flagellation among middle class white people, not all of it productive. But Rufo has framed these isolated incidents of ident ident identitarian malapropism as evidence of an overreaching Marxist plot to replace the quote, categories of bourgeoisie and proletariat with quote, the identity categories of white and black. When have the words white and black not been used to describe what goes on socially in this country from slavery days up to and through the present? Rufo says he has provided feedback on at least 10 of the critical race theory bills moving through state legislatures. He is adamant that they do not seek to govern what can be taught in the classroom. But isn't that what they say? Critical race theory is banned. 
continuing. And from a textual standpoint, he may be right, meaning that certain specific words may not be used. The Idaho bill prevents schools from teaching, quote, that any sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, or national origin is inherently superior or inferior. The Texas bill, meanwhile, stops schools from saying any individual is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. The rhetorical gambit is for the text to mimic the facially neutral language of civil rights, even as the rhetoric around the bill conjures up a Marxist, Marxist menace. People who might discuss these bills won't know the language in the bills, just as people in the legislature when I was there would talk about bills without having read them. They would introduce bills brought to them by lobbyists they had not read. So I would ask questions of the introducer about his or her bill, which that person could not answer. And that's why they thought I was so brilliant. I knew these people's bills better than they did, but I read the legislation. That's what I went there for, to be informed. And there were people who would come to me to have me explain to them what their bill was about. And if the bill was not harmful, I not only would explain it, I would draft amendments that they could take up to the bill drafter that would be incorporated into their bill or even take the place of their bill. But if it was one that I disagreed with, I would tell them, you have to find somebody else to do something about this poison that you're bringing, but be ready when you bring it on the floor because I'll be there waiting for you. And that would intimidate some of them to such an a point they would drop the legislation. And that's how my reputation for being the most powerful Senator who ever served in the Nebraska legislature came into being. My secret was to read the bills, to understand what they said, to understand what they did, to be able to describe the impact on the ordinary citizen, to explain how they either dovetail with other legislation that was already on the books or clashed with it or contradicted it. That's all that I did. That's all any person in the legislature should be expected to do, and that's the least such a person should be expected to do. Don't you think that a bus driver should be required to know if there are pedals on the floor, which pedal does what, which way to turn the steering wheel to make the bus go one direction or another, to at least know the difference between the gas pe pedal, which they call the accelerator, and the brake pedal? That's all I was telling these senators that anybody could require of them. But they didn't go there for the reasons that I have for going there. They wanted to be wined and dined by the lobbyists. And I ridiculed them so much about that that they finally cut it out. When we would stay late nights, late in the session, the lobbyists would actually be given a place in the legislature where they could prepare meals. And the senators would take time out from these long sessions that we had with me dominating. I never left the floor. I didn't feed off the lobbyists, but I ridiculed them and I talked about them. And one time I knew that they were in the middle of eating and I did something that I ordinarily won't do. I said, now I want all those senators who currently are eating to listen to this joke. There were two guys arguing in a tavern and there were spittoons. And one guy bet he could drink more out of the spittoon than the other guy. So they had the wager. And the first guy picked it up and saw that slimy stuff in there, cigarettes and cigar butts. And he said, I, 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 you go first. So this guy was drunker and he picked it up and he started chug-a-lugging and drinking. And, this brown slime was running down the side of his mouth, his neck soaking his clothes, and he continued. And when he got through, he belched. And they said, how in the world could you do that? You drank that thing dry. He said, well, it was just one long string. And people came out of that room where they were being fed by the lobbyists. Anyway. 
That's what goes on with the so-called critical race theory nonsense. Of course, it remains unclear who would enforce these types of laws, but Rufo and his fellow crusaders don't seem particularly interested in that. The single greatest threat to the Republican party is its newfound electoral weakness in the suburbs. In order to regain strength in those areas, especially during a midterm that will draw out a more educated segment of the electorate, the conversation that these people are having is the following. The conservative movement must convince suburban voters that the other side represents an unthinkable Marxist menace. And they don't even know what Marxism is, by the way. With a slew of state bills and an obsessive focus on a few isolated statements by misguided public employees, Rufo is attempting to convince swingable voters that liberals and leftists have engineered a totalizing takeover of public institutions. As in the days of Joseph McCarthy, the question is not whether the menace exists, but who can be made to believe that it exists. Rufo has made it his business to find it everywhere he looks. So now you know that this fellow Rufo was the one who started it all. Now, there are two conservatives who are famous. They made their money through chemicals, the chemical industry. They were known as the Koch brothers. They were born and raised, at least in their early years, in Germany, and their nanny was a practicing Nazi. And they are known to give to all kinds of foundations and charities. If you drive the highway, you may see occasionally these huge semis with the word Coke written on it, K-O-C-H. That's how they spell it. Some people pronounce it, who's, who has that as a name, Coke, some cook, others Koch. But the Cokes pronounce it Coke. This article was written or published October the 17th of last year. Conservative Coke Network disavows or is against bans on critical race theory. As conservative political groups mobilized to ban in schools what they call critical race theory, one prominent backer of Republican causes and candidates is notably absent. By the way, one of the Cokes died not long ago. Leaders in the network built by the billionaire Koch family say they oppose government bans over teaching about race and history in schools. While they note they don't agree with the ideas at the center of the fight, they argue the government bans now enacted in 11 states stifle debate in essential to democracy. Quote, using government to ban ideas, even those we disagree with, is also counter to core American principles. The principles that help drive social progress, said even Feinberg, executive director of the Koch affiliated Stand Together Foundation. That position is in line with the network's long held libertarian streak, but it has sparked fresh charges of hypocrisy from the mega donors critics. After spending years pouring money into conservative groups, the Koch groups cannot distance themselves from the movement it helped build, they argue. Quote, they have this nice position. They want to talk from a public relations standpoint, but their money has gone to these groups that have the opposite effect on that agenda, said Lisa Graves, board president for the liberal watchdog group Center for Media and Democracy. The Koch organization first went public with its position last spring as state lawmakers and conservative groups began passing legislation that bans from classroom specific concepts, including the idea that racism is systemic in society and the US legal system, everybody knows it. Everybody knows that if a defendant is black and the plaintiff white, 
the white person's going to win, the defendant's going to lose. They know that black people get arrested for nothing. They know that charges are trumped up. One young guy got a $900,000 settlement from the Kansas City Police Department. He was a teenager. They arrested him and held him in jail two or three weeks. They claim that they held him, they arrested him because he resembled a teen they were chasing who threw a gun away. Well, when the camera, the body cam was looked at, the one they were chasing was taller, thinner. He had a different hairstyle and different color clothing. The only thing that was the same was they both were black. So all the cops wanted to do was arrest somebody. When that body cam came out, the Kansas City Police Department immediately wanted to make a settlement and it was $900,000. You've seen time after time after time where police have shot black people under circumstances where they ought not even have been stopped by the police. And I won't detail them all because I don't have time. But for any white person, the most racist, to try to say there's not racism in law enforcement, in the courts, in prosecutor's office, is somebody not even worth acknowledging. It's out there and it's clearly out there. The Koch Foundation is deemed to be hypocritical because of it, the fact that it funds groups that sees these conspiracies everywhere, that supports this anti critical race theory, which they don't understand. But let me continue with this article. The effort, now who, who knows anything about the history of America would say that racism is not systemic. That means throughout and governing in society, whether it's employment, housing, where they're still redlining, trying to obtain loans, certain jobs, and in the legal system. And now with, with Trump and others, they deliberately say, we want judges who will uphold white supremacy. They don't use the words white supremacy, but the white way of doing things. Continuing, the efforts were prompted in part by the backlash to the 1619 Project, a New York Times Magazine initiative aimed at rethinking the role of slavery in the nation's history and development. Now, this book, see that it has almost 600 pages. It has numerous writings, essays by numerous authors. This is the 1619 Project, the book detailing it. And it, the idea was advanced by the New York Times Magazine and 1619 is the year that slaves were first brought here, <clears throat> excuse me, and taken off the boat. Now, when people are attacking the 1619 Project, do you think they even know what it is? Do you think they read this book? Do you think they even know that a book exists? called the 1619 Project. That's the ignorance, the ignorance and idiocy of white people. Not all white people, but the vast majority. They don't read, they don't think. What thinking they do is in cliches. They speak in slogans. Whatever the latest, latest thing is that was fed into them, that's the thing that comes out. A guy named Chaucer, old English author that most people don't know anything about, but I took, I studied English literature, did very well in the classes because I, I'm fascinated by words, by people who can put words together, draw word pictures that create an image in your mind of what they're talking about. He wrote the Canterbury Tales. These people were traveling and each person told a story. I'm not gonna go into all of them, but there's a line that I often use from my colleagues, he like a parrot was really quite dense. He remembered the words, but he didn't get the sense. So when they talk about critical race theory, they use the word, the words, but they don't know what they mean. They don't know the origin. So they're really dense. They utter the words, but they don't know what they mean. 
it's difficult to debate when the one you're debating is an empty wagon making a lot of noise. I have been to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology known as MIT invited when as Billy Joel sings in his song, Piano Man, when I wore a younger man's clothes, when I was much younger than I am now, invited to MIT. I worked with professors from Brandeis University. I had spoken at Vassar, Pittsburgh University, Colorado University, Colorado State, some school, I forget the name, in South Dakota, down in Florida. I went all over the country. I was even invited, naturally compensated, to address the executives of AT&T, that's American Telephone and Telegraph, at their headquarters in New York. And here's an interesting thing that happened. I think it's interesting. I have adopted for myself, as those who've heard me before will know, Popeye's motto. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. When I went to New York, I dressed the way I always dress. And I dressed the way I dressed was because that's the way I dressed when I cut hair. I wore a sweatshirt and jeans. And if that attire was good enough for the people who gave me my living, it was good enough for anybody. And I would not let anybody impose the so-called dress code on me. If there were a situation where it is required to dress a certain way and they know the way that I dress, then I would tell them I won't be there. And then they'd say, well, why not? Do clothes make that much difference? I said, I want to throw that question back to you. Do clothes make that much difference so that somebody you and your group want to hear will not be invited because of the way I dress? And invariably, they change their mind. So here I am in this swank restaurant. This was during the 60s, a long time ago, before some of you were born. And to, for a hamburger to cost $9 in those years would be considered exorbitant. But when I went there and I looked at the menu, I pretended being a man of the streets, a working man, not to understand what these terms were. But just between me and you, and as old people say, the gatepost, I knew how to pronounce everything on that menu because I read about them. I listened to how they were pronounced. So I said, what, what is this right here? And the guy, the waiter, oh, he was dressed to the nines. He had on a white jacket, dark clothes, and he was standing there looking very professional. And he explained in language that somebody that he perceived me to be, that it's really a hamburger. I said, oh, a $9 hamburger? He said, yes, but sir, called me sir, because around this table were the executives from AT&T and they dined there on a regular basis. Our dress code requires you to wear a jacket. I said, well, it's obvious I'm not wearing a jacket and I don't have one on the back of my chair, so I have no jacket to wear. He said, oh, we're prepared for that. We have a jacket that we can provide you. I said, I don't wear other people's clothes. So if a jacket is what I have to wear, all these gentlemen are jacketed, you are jacketed also, and that is the rule. I believe in following the rules, so I'm out of here. And I got about that far up in my chair, and the headman said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Told the waiter, bring the maitre d'. I even knew what that meant. So the maitre d' came, and they whispered for about three seconds. And the maitre d' looked at the waiter. He said, it, it's all right. Because, see, these were big shot white men. And when these big shot white men spoke, that became the law. The law had to be changed that would apply to any white person and especially to a black person who probably couldn't even get in there on his own. But I am what I am and that's all that I am. And to complete the story, I didn't eat anything. When I'm asked why I don't eat, I tell people I didn't come here to be fed. I came here to feed intellectually. So if you listen and pay attention, 
you learn something that you didn't know before I spoke. If you're very racist and hard headed, you're going to be like a statue where Brahms could be played and there'd be no reaction because the statue is not able to appreciate that kind of music. So let's go on from here. And when I spoke to those executives, they were very impressed. And I think they were doubly so because here's a young black man who could speak 10 words together and make sense. And I knew what they were thinking because I had read a lot about white people, executives, corporate structure. I was on their footing, but I stood head and shoulders above them intellectually. And I'm not saying that as a boast. That was demonstrated everywhere I went. I collect articles also, and they will always mention how fluently I spoke without notes. Well, I had notes, but they were inscribed on my brain. And I went there prepared not to read because I wanted to be able to look around that room all the time and see everything that was going on. And if I didn't know it, I wouldn't say it. But here's the funny thing. After I spoke for a period of time, they were prepared to accept anything I said as being true or at least plausible. And that's the way white people are. Appearances, badges, titles, all the superficial outward trappings. But I am what I am. And I told them what you see is what you get. And invariably somebody would want to title my speech because I wouldn't give it a title and I never called it a speech. I said, speeches are given by very important people and professors. I'm just a down here on the ground working man. I give talks, I talk to people. So I don't call what I do and give a speech. They would give a title because they have to do that. There's a form. And nine out of 10 times, the slogan in those days was, tell it like it is. And before I talk, I'd say, that is a common title that is given to my talks. They say, tell it like it is, until I tell it like it is. Then they become very offended. And I tell them, before you invite a man, to tell it like it is, you understand how that man believes it is. But in trying to be courteous and treat you the way I'd want to be treated, anybody who doesn't feel comfortable here is entitled to leave now and I will not take offense. And I'm going to give 30 seconds of silence when anybody who chooses to leave may do so. And guess what would happen? Uh, people began to twist and squirm in their seats, but nobody ever left. I've had experiences that would boggle the mind of these ignoramuses in Nebraska. And you know why I use that term? I use it advisedly. That's another way of saying I use it on purpose to serve a specific purpose. I looked at television and watched the campaign speeches, spots as they call them, that those running for governor will offer. These kind of people will have uh, usually an Eastern firm write these things out and choreograph it for them. So the first thing you have to realize is that those people in the East get a generalized opinion of what Nebraskans are like. And then they put words in the candidate's mouth that will appeal to those Nebraskans. And if you've been to the 12th grade, you'll know that those commercials of Pillen and that other fellow Herbster are laughable, are laughable. 
they are hokey. You would look at them and say, obviously the people out east think of Nebraskans as hillbillies, backward, ruralies, yokels, and backwood yokels at that. If you have intelligence, they're insulting you. They're putting that out there because they feel this is what appeals to you white people out there in Nebraska. Backwoods yokels, hillbillyish. You ought to be ashamed. And then here's this guy. Oh, how many of you all get up in the morning and look out your door and you see the rearing of cattle and somebody on a horse driving them? And this is about somebody who's going to take your state somewhere but they know white people, you all know each other. You know each other better than I know you apparently. I, give you, I gave you more credit for that than that. And based on what happened in the legislature, I felt you sent those dumbbells down there because you weren't aware of what they were and how dumb they really were. But I displayed so graphically what they were and you sent them down year after year after year, decade after decade, they couldn't handle me, so you had to figure a way to get me out of the legislature to stop embarrassing all the white people you sent down there. I was entitled to believe that you sent the best that you had to that legislature, and it was pretty poor stuff. So what did you do? The Constitution, the organic law of your state, you changed that Constitution to get rid of one Black man. One Black man was so awesome that 48 white people could not contend with him. So if I'm 48 times better than your best white person, how can I avoid feeling superior? But I didn't. I just felt they were victims of a poor upbringing. As little children, they were cheated in the classroom and not given the opportunity to learn. I think anybody when they come into this world has the potential to be an Einstein, may not be, but can learn. And a lot of times when they're crippled in school, they never overcome it. So you know the stereotypes of the backwood or rural school, people still call one room school houses, unqualified teachers, farmers who take off their one hitch suspender overalls and become the superintendent when somebody from the city is coming out to talk to whoever's running the schools. That's the image that is projected. And when you look at these commercials that are put together by the Eastern ad makers, you see what they think of those running for office and the ones they're trying to appeal to. So here's this one guy, he's got a cowboy hat on his head. I think it's Herbster. And they put courage, courage, cur what? What courage does it take to run for the governor of Nebraska? It doesn't take courage, but they say courage. And you white people in Nebraska, and I'm saying that hoping you're offended, because if you're offended, you'll pay attention and get angry. And anger, as the Bible says, resteth in the bosom of a fool. So I made a fool out of you already. Courage. He will protect us protect American, Nebraska, what do you need protection from? So first of all, this guy manifests courage because he's gonna run for governor and he's gonna protect you all. From what? Well, you're scared of everything. Look at those commercials and see what a low opinion you would have of anybody who would swallow that swill. One of them says, I've raised hogs and I know hogs slop when I see it. And that's what his commercial consists of, slop. And they're making fun of him and getting his money. Pillen had hired undocumented workers to work for him. Then when they started working, he called them contractors so he wouldn't have to pay any taxes. You know, when you work their employment taxes, 
he had to give back several millions of dollars that he got from that federal government handout. The handout that your governor is so willing to accept to create a surplus of money in the Nebraska treasury. Well, isn't your governor the one who is always talking about this big government in Washington, DC, how they have to be stopped? Then why take the money? These politicians are gonna to go to Washington to stop Washington, but then they wanna bring all the pork from Washington to Nebraska. They contradict themselves because they're ignorant. And in that, I mean it in the sense of not knowing, not understanding. It is pathetic. If you all were smart, you would want somebody like me as your governor, and this state would take off like a jet plane, and it wouldn't take that much to make it happen. But you fear people who think, who have principles. See, there's not a whiff of scandal connected to me. Nobody can say they gave me an illegal contribution because I don't accept funds. And whenever stories are given, written in a paper, about those who receive the most money and those who receive the least, guess who's always there for the least? Me, because the number that they use for me is not a number, it's a zero with a dollar sign because I don't accept anything from anybody. I do not try to impose my way of doing things on anybody else, but the least that you can expect from the people who offer themselves as your representatives, the least they ought to offer is an informed mind, a conscience that is sensitive to what is right and what is wrong, and to be honest enough to tell you what he or she actually believes in terms of what is right and what is wrong, and then lay out their positions in terms of what they will do. If I were to run for an office, I would tell them my record speaks for itself. Ask me a question about something and I'll tell you what my opinion is. If you agree and you know that I'm capable, then you'll vote for me. If you don't agree, you won't vote for me. I have never run and won an election where I received every vote something would be wrong if I did. I explained to people that I don't want somebody to agree with me just to agree with me. I don't even agree with myself all the time. I believe in what I say at the time I say it. But if I get additional information, I tell people my education has been improved. What I thought to be the case when I said that at that time, is not what I think is the case now because I have more information. I've changed my opinion, I've changed my mind and my conduct will reflect that. And they knew that in the legislature. If they could persuade me with argument, then they've got me. Provided it's not something I disagree with from the standpoint of what I deem to be right and what I deem to be wrong. If I deem something to be wrong, then they know they're not going to get me. But the extent of my opposition depends on how wrong I deem it to be, how much harm I think it will do. Now, I follow what I call the Lauren Schmidt, he was a senator, the Lauren Schmidt principle. I think it's so clever, I wish I could take credit for it. And because people don't know that he's the one who said it, I could get away with it. But I call it the Lauren Schmidt principle. This is a bill that doesn't help anybody. It doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't cost anything. Now bills like that, I let go through all day because it'll make the one who bring it, brings it feel good. But if too many of them come, then I start, I begin to stop them. And how do I stop a bill? First of all, I know what the bill says. I can pick it apart line by line, word by word, and I can offer an amendment on every line, and they know that. And some bills that I don't like, I'll draft my amendments in advance and file them on the clerk's desk, and everybody knows what they're gonna deal with, 
because I'll discuss every amendment that I bring. And here's how I do it. If you make a motion or offer an amendment, you have 10 minutes for your opening. Then you can speak two more times for five minutes. That's 20 minutes. And then if you're the introducer, you get five minutes more. That's 25 minutes. So I tell them, you all who know basic math, but if you've forgotten it, you've got computers. And if you don't have computers or calculators, you can ask a staff member. If I have 10 amendments, 10 times 25 would be 250 minutes. There are 60 minutes in an hour. Divide 225 by 60 and see how many hours you're gonna be here on these amendments. But then it's not just the amendment. I can take a vote on it. Then I can move to reconsider. My move to reconsider is a new motion and I'll get 10 minutes to open, five minutes, five minutes to speak on it, then five minutes to close. So that's 25 more minutes. So on one motion, original motion, I get 50 minutes. So if I have 10 amendments up there, you've got to multiply that by two because I'll offer a reconsideration motion. So there'll be 20 items that I can discuss, each one for 50 minutes. And that's how I did it. It was in a fishbowl. Everybody had a chance to observe what I did and how I did it. And I'm doing that for a purpose today to demonstrate that if I say something, I know what I'm talking about. I leave open the possibility that with all of my research and all of my study, I could have missed something and it's possible that I'm in error. So if you show me something that I think is correct, I see nothing for me to gain by holding to something that I know is false. So I will accept what you say and thank you for having improved my education. But before I launch on something, I do as much research, not as I can, but to be able to answer any questions that a group of moderately informed people on that subject would ask, but I know they're not informed at all. And I know they're not going to ask me any questions and I welcome them. I say, is there nobody with a question? If somebody will ask me a question, then I will take less time to discuss this motion and nobody will even take the bait then. There was one time I stood up to demonstrate how intimidated they were. And I didn't come there punching people, strangling people, grabbing people, shaking people, like white teachers used to do little black children when I was in school. And maybe if they hadn't dealt with this little black child that I was, when I couldn't fight and didn't know how to fight, and had been taught that I was to respect this white person, if that white person or those white persons who did it hadn't mistreated that child, that helpless child, the way they did, you all wouldn't have the black man that you have to deal with today. Some people are crushed by childhood experiences others are made stronger. You know that statement, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger and you can last longer. But this one day I stood up, will always stand, but in those days I would sit down occasionally and I kind of leaned into the mic and I said, you know what I'm gonna spend these five minutes doing? I'm just gonna spend these five minutes chuckling. Then I would chuckle <laughs> for five minutes. That's why I said I owned that legislature. And it's why white people were furious with me. 
How dare a black man come here? How dare a black man be so uppity? How dare a black man know the rules better than white men and women? So instead of telling the white men and women to learn the rules like I knew them, they wanted to get rid of the one who embarrassed these white people. And as they put it, embarrassed their state. The irony though, is that I got invited to things that they didn't. When I filed a lawsuit against God, people who understood it were putting on a conference in Italy and they were inviting people from all over the world, literally, to talk about whether or not there is a God. And they would have paid my way, but I told them I must be part vampire because I will not fly over the ocean and I will not be on a ship going over the ocean. And they say vampires fear running water. So I appreciate the offer, but I won't come. When I got the death penalty passed in Italy, they lit up the Colosseum in Rome with a big bear with a big banner saying, Congratulations, Nebraska, for abolishing the death penalty. And the young white senator who worked with me was named Colby Coash. I told him I was getting a lot of invitations and I was not going to do any traveling. So would he like to accept them because he had done so much work to help me get that bill passed? He said, Ernie, you mean it? I said, yes. So he went to Italy. He traveled all over the country. And I believe in giving credit where credit is due. And I told people the day that we overrode the governor's veto and they were praising me, the reporters were, I said, wait a minute, I didn't do this by myself. I don't have, I don't stand as 30 votes. I said, and if I could have done it by myself, you think all these years would have passed without me having done it? Go talk to Colby Coash. This young man did a yeoman like job. I even got an invitation from the French embassy to come to a gathering in Washington, DC, because they were going to discuss the worldwide attempt to get rid of the death penalty. And I turned it down. I don't know if Colby accepted it or not. But as I always say, when this time is reached, quoting the canary, when they told him the door to the cage is open, the canary said, I'm out of here. Thank you for watching the Ernie Chambers Show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication Production.